And so with that, um, I would like uh, to introduce uh, Will Chewy. Uh, he's a rising star here at Stanford um, in the uh, material science department. He was uh, the first um, a professor hired by the uh, Precourt Institute for uh, Energy. And um, he, uh, pretty much everything he does is energy related and uh, almost always involving um, electrochemistry. And uh, today he'll uh, talk about solar fields. Okay, Mike, thank you very much for the kind introduction and good afternoon. Welcome back to the afternoon session. Uh, so, as Mike introduced, uh, solar fields is a very promising route for storing sunlight. And we're going to talk a little bit about the project we started uh, one year and a half ago on how to use both light and thermal energy to make efficient conversion of sunlight to fuel. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, the contributor to this work. Uh, this is a collaboration, close collaboration with Nick Maloche uh, in the Material Science Engineering Department. The students at uh, Xiaofei Ye and Madhua Bilor uh, have been working on this, and a postdoc uh, Li Mingzheng as well. So, I always like to show this photo just because it's fun, and it also highlights the problem with sunlight. Uh, so, solar energy is a funny business because it doesn't shine everywhere. It doesn't shine all the time. And if you look at the population distribution versus solar resource distribution, it's also greatly mismatched. So you have Linden, Tokyo, and Chicago. These are places with either variable, intermittent, or poor solar resource, and yet this is where the population lies. So this, uh, this outlines some of the major motivations to develop technologies to be able to store sunlight so that it can be used when and wherever is needed. So one of the biggest challenge with solar and solar fuel is how do we increase the utilization of sunlight? And how do we do so with Earth abundant material? So let me briefly introduce what's being done now and how we are approaching the problem. So if you take a look at the solar spectrum, it's, probably, it's, it's roughly 55% visible, 5% UV, and 50% infrared. And you can take a semiconductor material to absorb the sunlight, generate electron hole pairs, and that can then be reacted with water to make hydrogen and oxygen, and that can be later combusted um, to form water again and producing electricity, heat as needed. If you take a look at the plot on the lower right, uh, that is the power of the sunlight as, as a function of wavelength. And you can see that we have a lot of sunlight at the large wavelength and the short wavelength as well. And if I have, uh, something like a 1.8 electron volt band gap semiconductor to absorb the sunlight, the part shaded in red is what I would take. Above and below the wavelength, most of the energy is either lost uh, as transmission or lost as heat. So it would be great if we're able to harvest those heat in addition to the photon energy as well. So to date, most of these so-called photoelectrochemical cells or photocatalysts operate at room temperature. Uh, it is very effective at taking the sunlight, but it's not so effective at taking the thermal energy. And that's what we chose to focus on about one and a half year ago at the beginning of our GSET project. Uh, it is to look at how we may be able to take both forms of energy and use that to increase the efficiency, the stability, of uh, the materials and also to decrease the use of precious materials like platinum. So the very first thing we did is to take a look at the economics, the efficiency. So is this a promising technology, theoretically speaking? So what we did is we simulated what we think to be a good solid state photoelectrochemical cell that can operate under a wide temperature range, all the way from room temperature to 1,000 degrees Celsius. The materials for this does not exist today, but we made a simulation nevertheless. And we, what we found was really quite surprising. If you look at the plot on the left, that shows the amount of energy that comes from the light and that comes from heat as a function of temperature of the solar um, field generator. So as you go from room temperature, so use mostly what we call the electrical energy, so that's the energy that comes from the generation of electron hole pairs, but as you go up in temperature, 
uh, say, for example, at four or 500 degrees Celsius, then you get a significant thermal contribution to the efficiency. So you can see the y-axis is essentially the efficiency you can hit. Uh, as you go from room temperature to 400 degrees C to 500 degrees C, you have a significant rise of the efficiency, and most of it actually comes from an increase in the thermal contribution to the amount of energy stored in the fuel. We also looked at as a function of material properties. So the plot on the right is a parametric plot of the operating temperature in Kelvin and uh, the band gap of the material. And the color shows you the predicted efficiency of the system accounting uh, for various loss terms. And this contour plot shows that at intermediate band gap, uh, approximately 1.8 to 2.4 electron volts, and at elevated temperature, 7, uh, 800 Kelvin, you can actually hit the sweet spot of the solar to fuel efficiency. And we estimate it upwards of 20% as possible, which is a significant step uh, beyond what we can do today. So with the theory understood, then we begin to explore actual material that can enable us to get to these temperatures of interest so that we can harvest both the thermal energy and um, the photon energy as well. One of the interesting things I'd like to talk about today is how can thermal energy make existing materials better? So I show a picture here. It's a, um, rocks that's composed of mostly iron oxide. This is a material that is of great interest to the solar fuel community because it's abundant and it is extremely stable. It is the most oxidized form of iron. So this is a material that exists in nature. Uh, sometimes it's called hematite. Uh, it's Fe203. The problem with materials like iron oxide, and another one I will talk about next, is there is not a very good semiconductor. So if you consider any photovoltaic-based process, you have to be able to absorb sunlight, then you have to be able to generate electron hole pairs, and you have to be able to separate them, just like any other solar cell. The problem with a material like iron oxide is that the electrons and hole move very slowly in the material. So the possibility for them to come back and generate heat is fairly large. The reason why iron oxide is not a very good semiconductor is because the mobility of what we call the minority carrier, the, um, the electron in this case, uh, is very, very low. So the electron barely moves, and this is due to a strong interactions of the electrons and the ion in the crystal lattice. So here I show you a plot of the mobility of silicon and the iron oxide as a function of temperature. And you can see silicon's way up there. Uh, it's about uh, 10 to the 2 centimeters squared per volt per second. And iron oxide actually has mobility that is immeasurable at room temperature because it's so lousy. But what you can see, a very significant contrast between the two material it is the slope on temperature. So while silicon decreases slightly in mobility when you increase the temperature, iron oxide actually increases dramatically, exponentially with temperature. So here we propose that increasing the temperature, which comes from uh, the incorporation of thermal energy uh, into photoelectrochemical cells, you're able to increase the minority carrier mobility so that you can separate the charge better in the photoelectrochemical cell. I should know there are very little routes you can envision which you can improve the mobility of a minority carrier in a semiconductor. You can think about doping, but that just increases the concentration of the majority carrier. There is not an all route. If you nanostructure, that's fine too, but again, you're not changing the mobility. So the fundamental limitation of these highly stable, abundant material like iron oxide is simply that the mobility isn't good enough at room temperature. So that's up the temperature and see what happens. So we first examined this iron oxide as a thin film geometry. Um, in my group, we do a lot of fundamental research uh, with uh, model systems. So we use pulse laser deposition to make a very thin 30 nanometer film of iron oxide on a platinized sapphire substrate. And you can see we were able to make very, very high quality structure. This is a little bit in contrast with the nanostructure that you see with PECs but this allows us to control the morphology perfectly. And what we did next is we designed an apparatus not only to control the light incident on the cell, 
but also to control the temperature, among various other things. So the setup on the left shows that we have a thermostatic controller, uh, a water bath basically, to set the temperature of the cell, and we have a liquid electrolyte system that allows us to go close to 100 degrees Celsius. So this is a liquid-based system, so we're capped uh, basically by the boiling point of water. So this is a standard electrochemical experiment, but we have very precise control of the temperature of the cell. In addition, in order to achieve higher temperature, typically optical concentration is needed. You have to focus the sunlight a little bit. So we also have a concentrated solar simulator so we can focus the sunlight down uh, to upwards of uh, nine times the solar uh, radiation uh, without concentration. So on the right, I have a couple of plots that shows the performance of this material. Uh, on, the, on the top is what we call the uh, IV curve, the current voltage curve under illumination. At the bottom, it's in the dark. So if you uh, haven't seen this before, essentially we want to push the curve to the left as much as possible so it has sufficient potential to dissociate water uh, into hydrogen and oxygen. So what I'm showing you is several curves of these iron oxide semiconductor at various temperatures starting from seven degrees Celsius to 72 degrees Celsius at two different optical concentrations. So again, we have one sun, so that's what we have out there. Not today, but if the sun was out, it would be one sun, and then nine times uh, that, okay? So I wanna point out several critical, critical uh, feature of the plot. So if you look at the plot on the top, as you increase the intensity of the sunlight, the current goes up proportionally. So this is, a, this is a great news. So this means we're able to shrink down the size of the cell and still achieve the same current. This doesn't happen everywhere. Depending on how good the materials are separating charge, you might not get a one-to-one -one improvement. So here, when we increase the, we increase the optical concentration, we have, a con um, we have a corresponding increase by nine times in the current, thereby achieving something that's quite nice. Then when we increase the temperature, you can see the voltage actually moves slightly to the right. So as I mentioned before, we want the voltage to go to the left, so this is not the best situation. Now if you turn your attention to the dark current voltage curve, you see actually the curve is indeed shifting to the left if you don't have any light. And what's more important is that when you increase the temperature, the driving force needed to break the water molecule decreases as well. And I note that with the two voltages on the bottom, it decreases by about 50 millivolt, but the actual voltage decrease we see, the shifting to the left of the plot, is actually much more significant. So from the bottom plot, we can conclude that by increasing the temperature, we're putting thermal energy into the electrons and the molecules to improve the rate of electrocatalysis. So even without light, iron oxide is functioning as a better material, and when we put the light in, it decreases a little bit, the shift is smaller than the gain you're getting, so that's good. And then furthermore, if we concentrate the light, we're able to substantially increase the current. And also by increasing the intensity of the light, you're also shifting the voltage to the left as well. So by carefully playing with temperature and light intensity, we're able to do what we want, which is push the voltage to a lower value on this plot and push the current higher. This is just a plot showing you the enhancement. We were able to take the curves from the previous slide and decouple it into various contributions. Here I'm showing you the relative potential, so this is the relative voltage, if you will, compared to the baseline case, which is room temperature and one sun, no optical concentration. As you can see, on the top case, when we increase the temperature without increasing the intensity, you have a general movement to the right. So you have the so-called onset potential. This is when the current starts to take off. It's moving to higher values, so this is not good. The photo voltage is also moving to smaller values. That's not good either. But the overpotential is decreasing, so this is um, the amount of excess driving force needed to catalyze the reaction. And also, the equilibrium voltage, so the thermodynamic voltage needed to break the water molecule, is also decreasing. But on a net basis, you're losing. But on the second, um, row where we have increased temperature and increased optical concentration, then we have everything moving in the right direction. Uh, sorry, that means everything moving in the right direction to the left. So you have the thermodynamic driving force needed decreasing, 
you have the overpotential required decreasing, you have the fold of voltage actually increasing slightly, and then you have the overall onset potential, so this is where the current start to take off, also decreasing by about 70 millivolt. So this is a considerable first step to demonstrate that it is a good idea to put in light and heat into the photoelectrochemical cell to improve the efficiency. The increase is relatively small here because we're going to very moderate temperature. We're only increasing the temperature here um, by 60 degrees Celsius. And I will discuss a little bit on the opportunities to go much higher in temperature. But this is not the best part of the story. For those familiar with solar cells, one of the key characteristics of solar cell is the so-called fill factor. The fill factor basically tells you how fast your voltage increases with potential. Ideally, we want something kind of like a square rather than a slanted line on this curve. And what I'd like to point out to you is the current actually rises much faster with potential when you increase the temperature. And I can show you this better by blocking out some of the data. So if you just focus on um, the range between 0 0.3 and 3 milliamp per square centimeter, you can actually see the curvature changing. So when the temperature is low at 7 degrees Celsius, it's quite a bit curved. And when you increase the temperature to 72 degrees Celsius, the curvature decreases substantially. So this means that the amount of excess voltage you need to get to the high current you want is not less. So let me plot that. I'm basically showing you here the voltage difference needed to go between these two currents. So the voltage difference needed to go from 0 0.4 to 4 milliamps. Okay, so this is the extra voltage needed. At 7 degrees, you need to give about 300 millivolt in order to achieve a tenfold increase in the current. But in the case of 72 degrees C, you only need about 200 millivolt. And the difference is about 160 millivolt. So in the previous slide, I showed you how the onset potential, so when the currents start to take off. This plot is showing you how high current behaves. And this is actually where it matters because we will not want to operate our cell at very low current. So this tells you by increasing the fill factor with thermal activation, you're able to achieve higher current with less applied potential. And the reason for this, we have shown, is due to the increased, much improved mobility of the minority carrier in iron oxide. So we're better able to separate the charge, and that's leading to a much faster rise of the current with voltage. So that's the first material we looked at. The second material we looked at, which also turns out to be one of these low mobility semiconductor, is bismuth venidate. This is being a material that's heavily investigated uh, in GSET programs and elsewhere. And it's a very promising material because it exhibits a very significant photo voltage. But one of the not so well known fact about this material is that the electromobility also sucks. And by increasing the thermal energy into the system, we have the opportunity to also improve its photochemical properties for converting sunlight um, into fuel. So I just show you here some scanning electron micrographs uh, these are the nanostructure we have created through a series of electrode deposition and pyrolysis reactions. We try doping the system to improve uh, the, uh, the conductivity of the majority carrier. We also add a catalyst to it. But without showing you too many details, essentially we're able to create state-of-the-art business venidate uh, material for photoelectrochemical cell at room temperature. So the next thing we wanted to do was to see how thermal energy could improve the performance of the material. Well, we saw actually an even more dramatic dependence on temperature than iron oxide. In the case of bismuth venidate, when we increase the temperature, the current under illumination versus voltage rises significantly with temperature. If you take a look at the higher voltage part, you can see that the current actually increases by almost 50% as we go from 9 degrees Celsius to just 42 degrees Celsius, just a very small temperature increase. And then simultaneously, 
the voltage barely changes, the onset voltage on the bottom. So this is great because we're maintaining a very high power output of the photoelectrochemical cell. We further investigated this. We wanted to know exactly how much the open circuit potential is changing, and we did a, um, a rigorous measurement of the open circuit potential of the cell, and we saw that the voltage declined at about three millivolt per Kelvin. And you can see the plot on the lower right um, at various concentration, that's at one sun and three sun concentration, we have a open circuit potential close to 800 millivolt. And we're losing some voltage, absolutely, but we're gaining a lot more in the current. So you can see with the, with the temperature, we're gaining substantially higher saturation current. And the reason is, again, you're getting better electron hole charge separation, so these carriers can better, has a better chance of reaching the water molecule to split it into hydrogen and oxygen. So people always ask me, well, increasing the temperature generally decreases the stability. Well, it turns out that's not so much the case here. For both the iron oxide and the bismuth venidate, the stability is actually rather good. So on the left plot, we have the iron oxide, this is where we held the current constant and we monitored the voltage. For the bismuth venidate, we did the opposite. We held, um, we, uh, held the voltage constant and monitored the current, and just because two different people did the experiments. And we can see that the stability is excellent. The ripples you're seeing is due to the formation of bubbles uh, on the top of the photoelectrode, so don't worry too much about that. But the bottom line is that we have stability over a relatively short period of time, five hours. But we have seen stability upwards of 50 hours is also possible as well. And we're working toward improving the stability of the system at even higher temperature. So if I were to summarize the results so far, the concept of a thermally enhanced photoelectrochemical cell is appealing to us because of the following. In the left, you have the standard case of non-concentrated light hitting on a photoelectrochemical serosolar cell. So this is the baseline case. One possibility in the second case is you can concentrate the light, but in the case of solar cell, you usually have to cool the solar cell because the power output of the solar cell decreases. So you have to have active cooling. This has been a challenge uh, with the field of concentrated photovoltaics because the expenses associated with cooling and system complexity. What we show here is the third case. With photoelectrochemical cell, it is not necessary to cool it. In fact, we want it to heat up because the extra thermal energy can improve the total current and the voltage output of the cell and therefore improve the efficiency of sunlight to fuel processes. So this is my last slide. All is great, we can go up to about 100 degrees C, but then water boils, then we're out of luck. So actually, the main thrust of our GSEP work is to look at how to take the liquid cell up into a solid state cell in which the temperature can go far beyond 100 degrees Celsius. So we essentially take the liquid electrolyte and replace it with a solid electrolyte that can go much higher in temperature. These are typically ceramic materials. And then to achieve the type of temperature needed, say four or 500 degrees Celsius, this is where I show the efficiency simulation to exhibit the highest value. We will need also some sort of solar concentration system as well, and I show just a one possibility of using a heliostat field, and we're working very closely with industry to think about a system level implementation. So with that, I would like to conclude. Uh, I've showed you some preliminary results of liquid cells with significant improved efficiency just by modulating the temperature. And I also show you the possibility here to go much higher in temperature. So next year, I hope to share results on the solid state cells, which we can hopefully achieve efficiency that matches our predictions. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the support from GSEP, its sponsors, and also the Precourt uh, Institute for Energy. And thank you for your attention. Questions? Uh, very nice, very interesting. Uh, it's uh, interesting to me, though, that you're going to be, one of the things you want to do is split water uh, and then burn hydrogen later on at perhaps 50% efficiency, and the sun uh, conversion that you're doing is 
what would you suggest, 10%, 20% efficiency? That's an excellent question. So the sunlight to fuel, I think if we can hit something like 20% or even a little bit higher, that's already a very, very good um, performance. And then if you want to combust the hydrogen, I certainly would not be advocating to burn it. Uh, if we run it through a fuel cell, then we can get efficiency upwards of 90%. But once you have hydrogen, it serves as an excellent precursor molecule to do other things as well. For example, we can perform hydrogenation of carbon dioxide. So that could be one route toward making liquid fuel. So hydrogen is just a starting point. I should also emphasize the type of chemistry we're exploring it is not limited to only water and hydrogen. We're also pursuing very strongly CO2 chemistry, so we can reduce CO2 to carbon monoxide. Again, that is a precursor. So if we have hydrogen and CO, that's synthesis gas, and we can pretty much do everything from there as well from the chemical uh, engineering perspective. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and just one other thing having to do with the helio heliostat uh, system. If you do that, the purpose there is to generate electricity or uh, the purpose still to generate hydrogen? Yes, the purpose there is just to provide a mechanism to provide for the optical concentration. So as you saw here, it is not possible to reach the type of temperature we're talking about without moderate optical concentration. And here we are envisioning that we can pick it back onto development of existing solar concentration technology, and the cost is decreasing every day in the solar thermal electricity generation. So the, the vision I would have is that part of the solar thermal plant will be generating electricity during the daytime, part of the other part of it will be generating fuel. And at nighttime, this then can be used for uh, dispatchable electricity without the sun. Or you can think about multi-day dispatchability. If bad weather in the winter, then you can have fuel for a couple days to run. So therefore, having a very equalized output of electricity from the solar thermal system. A very good talk. Um, now, your quantum yield at this point is very low. Very low. What, what do you think is limiting your quantum yield? And uh, what do you need to do to get to a point uh, to be practical for uh, hydrogen generation, yeah. for example, in the 5% quantum efficiency? Yeah. Well, actually, in our bismuth venidate work, the quantum yield is already very good. We're comparable to the best reports in literature. Actually, in this case, the main problem is the voltage. Because the voltage naturally declines with temperature, so we always have to make sure we have enough voltage input, and we don't want to, gen we don't want to have to put in extra voltage into the system. So what we're looking at now is to increase the voltage output by, for example, selectively removing the electron holes with selective contacts. We're also looking at heterojunction so we can better separate the electron hole pairs so that we can retain the high voltage that you would have room temperature but at elevated temperature. So I think the voltage is the primary challenge going forward. Hi, Will. Excellent Andrew. presentation. Hi, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I was wondering um, if you could comment on the use of catalysts or not at higher temperature, and, and you're thinking on why you would or wouldn't want to use them, and maybe the effect on stability as well. Yeah, that's a great question. So. If we take a look at other high temperature electrochemistry uh, fields, such as high temperature fuel cells, actually platinum and other precious group materials are not the best performance. It turns out metal oxide, inexpensive metal oxide catalysts are the best at high temperature, not the precious materials. So I foresee that the catalyst um, use will be non-precious, it will be quite low, and because they're metal oxides, mostly refractory, high melting point metal oxides, the micro nanostructure will be extremely stable at high temperature. So there we can draw from the deep expertise uh, within the high temperature electrochemistry community to try to build up a earth abundant catalyst system for our photoelectrochemical cells. Okay, let's uh, thank Will for an excellent lecture. Thank you.